Okay, so thank you so much for coming to our session with Monash University on how they have reached 100,000 MFA registrations in just 100 days. So, Safe Harbor slide, there was some roadmap that we discussed soon, so this is typical legal documentation. Um, so my name is Jade, and I'm the product manager for end user experience at Okta. And what really thrills me about having Monash here with us today partly as I'm Australian, uh, is that Monash is, one of the to is constantly in the top 1% uh, uh, of universities around the world. They're the largest university in Australia and uh, leaders in uh, research such as biometric, um, no, uh, IVF and the World Mosquito Program. And their user base is spans across the world with campuses across Asia, India, um, and, and Africa. So uh, given that, uh, their IAM story with Okta has been really incredible with a lot of speed and scale, including 170,000 users in Okta, 130,000 users in MFA, 60,000 groups, and over 250 applications. And having had done this in just 100 days, we're really, really proud to, sh have, uh, to have them here to share their story with us. So without much further ado, I'd like to introduce Cameron and Andrew to, to come on stage. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Andrew Collins. I'm a solution architect for the identity team at Monash University. And I'm Cameron Duck. I'm the lead systems engineer for single sign-on for the identity team at Monash Uni. So I don't need to tell you why MFA is so important for your organisation. One of those reasons for us was the silent librarian. So this is a phishing attack that's targeting universities with uh, research data. So far they've taken 31 terabytes of uh, data, costing universities around the world $3.4 billion. So back in 2017, we started to roll out MFA with our existing ADFS environment. So at the time, the user experience was really, really poor, and some of the core requirements that we needed just didn't exist with ADFS. So we needed to go to market and, and find another product. And this is where we found Okta. So along our journey with Okta, we discovered that we could do a lot more than just MFA. We could then migrate all of our applications from ADFS over to Okta. We could also then look at using skin provisioning for some of our applications like Workplace and Slack, and also implement API management. So then we could integrate with MuleSoft and help strengthen our APIs. Now, one of the core things with Okta was the user experience. Signing in, signing up for MFA was really easy for the user. It was just really following a bouncing ball. One of the other core requirements was to be able to remember the user's device as well. As Okta is a, a cloud provider, uh, we were able then to remove our ADFS infrastructure. So then we didn't need to worry about patching systems or um, upgrading them and you know, looking at performance. So how did we roll this out to an organization of our size? So we needed to break this down into three manageable phases. Our first phase was to federate Okta with ADFS. And our second phase was then to migrate all of our applications from ADFS over to Okta. And our last phase was to roll out MFA to our organization. Now this was going to be one of our biggest challenges. Right here, so this is how we started off. Our users would log in to ADFS, create themselves, they get a SAML assertion for which of the various applications that, the, uh, that they wanted to access. The first thing we had to do in our migration was build up our Okta org and federate it, uh, join it with ADFS. We needed to make sure that Okta would pass through all the attributes that ADFS would need to create any assertion for any application and we needed to make sure that ADFS would now take those new attributes rather than the ones coming directly from AD. Then came cutover day. So across about five hours, 
we change the home realm or the login page for each of our applications in ADFS so that we'd then present the Okta login page. So the users went from seeing only the ADFS login page to only seeing the Okta login page even though the apps were still connected to ADFS. This was the biggest change that our user base was going to see and we did it across one day. So once we finished our first phase, we could move on to the second phase by moving all the applications from ADFS over to Okta. So what we really needed to do early on in the project was get the contact details of the, of the applications as, as early as possible. So this is a very time consuming task. Um, once we got this information, we could then send out uh, what the user needed to do uh, and when. We also then created a schedule, so a migration schedule, which consisted of 20 windows over the 34 day period. So then the application owners selected one of these windows on when they were going to migrate. So we capped this at about 10 applications in these windows. So then we could concentrate just on migrating those ones in that window. So how did we help our application owners migrate? So we were able to pre-stage all of our applications in Okta um, prior to the migration windows. This allowed us then to send the metadata and configuration files to the, to the user so then they could work out what they needed to change. We also provided an end-to-end -end QA environment so then they could also run their full end-to-end -end tests. This also made them feel very comfortable on the migration day. So one of the things we need to make sure is our Okta admins were well trained in Okta, but more importantly, trained in troubleshooting SAML. So we have a lot of application, uh, uh, applications that the, the owners aren't technical people. So we needed to jump in there and, and help, help configure their app or troubleshoot some SAMLs, see if they're getting their assertions. So if we didn't do this, we wouldn't have been able to migrate the apps at this speed. So after we migrated our apps, uh, we were able to then to start rolling out MFA. So one of the things, one of the key things for this was to, to get your sponsors on board. So make sure your executive team want this rolled out. So this is really easy for us to do because of all the breaches uh, recently in the news. Our exec team wanted this rolled out yesterday. So we cashed in on this idea and decided to use our executive team and our IT department as our pilot users. So early on in the piece, we found that there was really no graceful way of introducing MFA out to our organisation. So we came up with this idea to create a, a, an opt-in page. So what this is, is, is a page where a user could go to and opt-in for MFA at a time convenient to them. So just imagine rolling out MFA to thousands or 10,000 people at a time. And you know, they might have had a presentation to do or a student had to submit an assignment. So this is one of our core things of rolling out MFA. So as for the actual rollout process, we advertise this page for around about two weeks, and then we enforce them to use MFA after that two week period. And we roll this out in stages through our faculties and, and in batches of students. So while we were rolling this out, we, we made sure all our support mechanisms were in place as well. So we had people walking around helping people sign up for MFA. We also had our service desk. You know, when someone was calling the service desk, they'd also help sign up for MFA. One thing that we needed to get right from day one as well was our instruction page and our FAQ pages. So these were very detailed. We had instructional videos on how to sign up for MFA and then how to change your device. Our FAQ pages were, were in different categories, so it was really easy to find your answers. And these were into sections like general use, what if I've uh, lost or my phone's been stolen or I've got a new phone? Uh, Travelling to a new country. And we had a section on privacy as well. So it's really important that this page also is a public link and not behind authentication. Because if they're having difficulty logging in, then they wouldn't be able to get to the help pages. Rightio, as you can imagine, the 
Factors that you choose are very important. You want to make sure that you choose factors that are secure enough so that it's not easy to get in through your brand new security you've just built, but also user friendly enough that you don't have a backlash from your user base, or in some cases have them actively try and circumvent, to, <laughs> circumvent your uh, multi-factor authentication. So the factors that we went with were OctaVerify with push, Google, Google Authenticator, YubiKey OTP, and U2F. When we looked to verify, because it's very easy to sign up, just scan the QR code, off you go. And then when you go to use it, you get a notification on your phone, you check that yes, that is you that's trying to log in and click approve. Google Authenticator was turned on because we have some user base that doesn't change over their phones very often and can have very old operating systems, some so old that OctaVerify wouldn't actually run on it. And because there's so many different Authenticator apps, we were able to find, most of the time, find one that would work on those phones. We also used it as a backup code because currently OctaVerify doesn't restore when you change phones over where some Authenticator apps do. The U2F factor is another very easy to use factor. You plug your key into the side of your laptop, you press the button and you're in. Once again, we ran into a couple of problems. Our VPN doesn't support U2F and neither does some browsers. So for users that didn't have a phone, we provided them with their YubiKey and used the one-time password factor. Now you notice that we didn't go with security questions or SMS voice. That's because the security questions are very easy to get around to socially engineer the answers. And for SMS voice, it's also easy for the person trying to get into your account. They can call your phone company and convince them to port your number to their SIM, in which case they will get this SMS message to uh, give them the code to log into your account. I will now walk you through the process we set up for our users so they can opt in for MFA. They visit our opt-in website, mfaoptin.monash.edu. They are given some information about MFA and why the university is rolling it out. They then click Next. Here, they can select the type of smartphone they have, enter their mobile number, and click Send Me a Link. This will send an SMS to their phone, which contains a link to OctaVerify for their operating systems app store. If they do not have a smartphone or are not able to install the app, there's a link with other options for them. Once they have installed OctaVerify, they click on Register Now to continue the process. They will need to log in with username and password. This brings the user to the MFA enrollment process. All of our users by default have the OctaVerify and Google Authenticator factors available for them. The user then enrolls OctaVerify. The user has the option for enrolling for another factor or finish the process by clicking Finish. What the user does not see is that their account is added to a group which is linked to our policy that says they must MFA every time from now on. Rightio, we had a couple of special scenarios that we had to consider. Our first one are our custom or role accounts. These are accounts that multiple users use, for example, reception for a building and things like that. So for these, these accounts, we used Google Authenticator because you can enroll multiple devices against the one account. We had some scenarios where the users that logged into the account, not only were they not in the same building, they weren't even in the same location or in extreme cases, the same country. So having a single device that was kept at the desk wasn't any good for us. The next one were our senior staff that have executive assistants. Unfortunately, some of our applications don't allow for delegated tasks. So for the EAs to do their job, they need to log in as their boss. So in these cases, uh, the senior staff member would enrol OctaVerify on their phone and then we'd set up a YubiKey and give that to the assistant so when they needed to log in as their boss, they could do that. As a research university, we have a number of labs that 
people aren't permitted to bring their phones or YubiKeys in and out of due to contamination reasons, whether that's bringing contaminants out of the lab or bringing them in. So in these cases, we set up a network zone that said any machines that are in these labs, they don't need to MFA. Doesn't matter who logs into them. The lock on the door for the lab, we consider the second factor. Our last scenario were electronic exams or e-assessments. So Monash University is currently doing electronic exams. So no longer do the students need to bring a pen and paper in and write their essays out and tick A, B, C, D, all that sort of stuff. They can do it on a laptop in the room. But as you can imagine, examiners don't really like students bringing their own phones into an exam. So we worked with our network team to be able to set up another network zone with its own policy that we can turn on and off during exams to say that any students logging into these laptops don't need to MFA. We are looking later on this year to be able to do a BYOD for the exams, and I'm sure that's going to be another conversation with our network team to work out exactly what we're going to need to do for those ones. Now, some of our sign-in policies. Because the direction that we were given by our CIO at the start of this project was that all accounts must MFA for all logins for all applications. All of our policies are set at that top IDP level. There is no policy signed set up for individual applications. Everyone must follow the same set of rules, no exemptions. So if I'm a regular user, I come to work every day, or I'm a student, come on campus to study, or I'm studying from home, I go to my email or something, username, password, go for the second factor, get the push to my phone, accept. There's a tick box that says, don't prompt me on this device again. And if they do that, they never have to MFA again from their own laptop. It's just the one-off time. They also have a long session life. So worst case scenario, they have to log in twice a day if they work 24 hours a day. Our next scenario, as you saw, we have people all over the world and people traveling all over the world. So we set a policy that says the first login from a new country, once again, you must MFA. So when I landed here in San Francisco, grabbed my laptop, go to login, check my email. Even though it was my laptop, I ticked the box before, I still had to MFA because it's a new country and I'll have to MFA again when I get back home to Australia. Our VPN is set up for MFA now as well. Because the VPN is a good access point into our network, we made sure that you must VPN, uh, you must MFA every time you VPN, because we want to make sure that the people on our network are meant to be on our network. And lastly, our privileged users. We increase security for our privileged accounts. So for example, all of our Okta admins, they're only allowed to use a U2F token as their second factor no Okta Verify, anything like that, just U2F, have a very short session length time. We wanted to make sure that our accounts that have the most access also have the highest security on them. So during our rollout of <coughs> MFA, we came up with a few different challenges. So the first ones were people that didn't have a mobile device and also people who didn't have a supported device, so they couldn't install the OctaVerify app. And one of the most frustrating things was people who didn't want to use their personal device for, for MFA. So our solution was, to this was to supply them a YubiKey. So this worked in most cases, except for when they wanted to access, say, email on their phone and it didn't support USB. One of our biggest challenges was the operational support. So we concentrated on rolling out MFA as quickly as possible and protecting our organization. And we're very happy in how this went. But the number of people who you know, either lost their phones or damaged or upgraded their phone, we were getting around about 1,000 of these per week. Now, because we didn't select SMS, 
it wasn't as simple as taking your SMS out of one phone and putting it in the other one and they conti continue to do MFA. So they had to call the service desk. So at the moment, we're working on a, a backup feature. So, so what this is, it's a website that users can go to, register for 10 one-time backup codes, and store that safely in their personal vault or wherever. And when they need to reset their phone, they can go back to the website and enter in their, you know, enter in their one time code and, and reset their own factor. So I'm about to show you a demo of what this looks like today. I will now walk you through the process for registering for backup codes. This user has been enforced for backup codes, so next time they log in, they will have to register. They access the application, in this case Gmail, and need to log in. As this is our QA environment, the login process is slightly different from production. They need to use MFA as, as it is required for all logins. The user is then prompted to enrol for backup codes. They are taken, taken to our backup code SAML application and click Next. They are now presented with their backup codes and three options on how to store them. They can send them to a non-university email account. We have blocked users from sending the backup codes to an email address owned by the university as there's not much point storing the codes in a mailbox that they need access to the codes to log in with. They can also print the codes out or download them as a text file. I find the best option is to download them as a text file and store them in my password manager. This way they are stored securely and I know where they are when I need them. The users are then shown a quick GIF on the code usage. So just to recap, make sure you know who you're going to impact. Get your support early from your executive team. Plan ahead and make sure you have a really good rollout strategy. But most importantly, support your end users throughout your, throughout your journey and beyond. So what's on for the year for us? Well, we need to release our new backup codes feature, and I wish we could show you that. We're also looking at integrating Okta with MuleSoft, so we can then protect our APIs with OpenID Connect. And we'll also be looking at new security features like behavioral policies and, and WebAuthn. So we're very happy on, on how our journey has, has gone now with Okta. And we're looking forward to continuing our partnership uh, with Okta and, and releasing all these new features. That was awesome. So thank you so much, Andrew and Cameron, for talking through essentially our partnership with, with Monash. And we've learned a lot as Okta partnering with them on this experience. And I want to talk about security and user experience with Okta. So we're all pretty familiar with this kind of paradigm on security and user experience. And how we really think about it and you've probably thought about this when you, were, when you are rolling out or designing the security flows for your end users. But what we believe at Okta is that if it's not usable, it is not secure. As I'm sure you can relate, just rolling out the factors is only part of the journey. Getting your users to adopt, getting your users to understand is a whole uh, change management flow that you have to consider. And when we think about building these secure user experiences, there's a lot of pillars that we have, we, we as a product team, play into consideration. Um, setting it up as appropriate levels to what you're protecting. Distribute it across the flow so it doesn't hit the user all at once. And finally, the responsibilities between both the user and the system. A great analogy is, for example, car safety. Although the user has to put on the seatbelt, the car is also building with airbags to protect the user. And at Okta, we care, we listen to our users a lot, our end users. We read and respond to every single review that they write. 
we also proactively ask for feedback within the applications and the experience to see like how can we make things better for them and, and hear from them on how, how they're using our products. And we're constantly looking at metrics and tracking uh, product health to see adoption and success. And that feedback has been used to guide every chapter of the user journey from adoption to signing in, giving them controls to manage their security, and of course, the core of why they're even here in the first place, accessing the applications they need where they get their most uh, productive work done. So I want to highlight some uh, roadmap uh, items that are coming highlights this year, which uh, we've learned and also partnered with on Monash. So Monash did an amazing job on writing documentation and FAQ and helping with end users understanding why Okta helping the end users understand Okta and why it's used. And we're currently, uh, and some of our customers have done some amazing work on this as well. So we are rolling out a new end user adoption toolkit with customizable templates, FAQs, and information for you to adopt, not only rolling out Okta for the first time, but also new features and products that you want to release in your organization and simplifying that for you. On signing in, we currently have in beta the passwordly experience helping users to not only have a more delightful experience of not having to enter passwords, but also using more secure, uh, like a better security flow using factors like OctaVerify or YubiKey as the way to uh, verify their identity and, and, the, and the device. Also, the experience of needing to reset the MFA. So there were examples where students um, would leave their device at home and they needed to reset it, but they're in the middle of an exam or they need to, or they're rushing to a, uh, rushing to a, uh, a class and they need to really quickly access that the information they need. So we are introducing, we'll be introducing soon the ability to defer factor enrollment, giving you the admin the control to uh, push out the, uh, giving a grace period to the users to be able for when they need to enroll in their factors. Finally, what, also, what, what can users do right now if they do see something on their account that they don't recognize? What kind of controls do users have to protect their identity and your data? Well, we are, we, right now in beta, there's ability for uh, to you to, uh, report, for end users to be able to support report suspicious activities, such as unusual logins, and uh, password reset flows that they don't recognize, or MFA enrollment flows that they don't recognize, which will give you also the admin the ability to respond quickly and lock down and automate the response to, to protect your data. Finally, when we think about when users are actually using these products to SSO, we are, we are working, we are really investing in usability on the devices that they, that, they, that they use. So on mobile, we are redesigning the uh, sign-in flow with Okta Mobile using the sign-in widget. So users can now MFA on the go and also um, can, can SSO on the go and also use it to self-service unlock and reset their passwords, having a one-stop shop to take care of their Okta needs. And for some of you users who do use the Okta dashboard, we're all pretty familiar with this dashboard page that we love and know very well. So this year, we actually are investing in a new end user design altogether. It will be more modern, intuitive, responsive, and accessible. So there's a lot coming on this roadmap that we've learned and discovered partnering with our customers like Monash, understanding their user needs, understanding what they're going through, and trying to partner together to make it, uh, to make it better. So, um, if some of these uh, features really interest you, we'd love to have your, uh, have your feedback. Um, go to this QR code or go to this link and leave your details. And also, if you're interested in seeing uh, the demo that we would like to, we would like to have shown you, please leave, leave your details here and we can contact you afterwards to, to share that information. So without much, I'd like to invite Andrew and Cameron back on stage to open the floor to any Q&A. Um, there are mics being passed around right now, so uh, please, if you get a mic, put your hands up and also stand up so we can see you oh. better. Hi. Um, first, congratulations on a job well done there. It seems 
Maybe I can hire you to do it to my company. <laughs> no, no um, but seriously, I, uh, I was a little disappointed in, the, in not seeing on the roadmap that challenge that you guys have to face head on with the, um, the uh, temporary code. Yep. And I was um, wondering if you can elaborate more on that since we weren't able to see the video. Um, I think that's going to be our biggest challenge. I know this challenge is in terms of um, hardware tokens, you know, YubiKey and things like that for people who don't want to use their phone, uh, privacy concerns and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I think that is probably the biggest. Okay, so what you would have seen in the video <laughs> was we're using the custom SAML factor that's currently in beta. So it acts like any other factor, but it goes off to a SAML application. So when the user enrolls, they're taken off to the application and they're presented with 10 one-time use codes. They have the option to email those codes to themselves, but not to a Monash University email account because there's no point storing your codes in the account you need your codes to get into. Uh, they can print them out on a sheet of paper or they can save them as a text file. So I save mine as a text file, store it with my password vault, I have it there. So if I've broken my phone or replaced my phone so I no longer have that, that second factor, I go to log in, I go to the pull down to choose which factor I want to use, I can select the backup codes, the backup codes, grab one of those 10 codes, type them in, and I log in as per normal like it's just another another factor. That code's no longer usable, so I've only got nine left, but because I've got in, I can then reset the factor myself, enroll my new phone, and I'm all good to go. Did you guys also roll out modern authentication and disabling things like IMAP and POP um, at the same time that you did MFA? Is that still ahead for you, or, or what does that look like? No, not at the same time, but um, we're in the process of working through that at the moment, disabling that through Google. Excellent. Thanks. Hi, guys. So uh, with the common scenario of a user losing or misplacing their device and they call up looking for help, how do you validate they are who they say they are? It's always a challenging one, that one. Um, <clears throat> I've actually got a really good diagram um, on my laptop. But, um, so there's a few things they need to go through and you know, providing um, their date of birth, first name, last name, things like that, student ID. Um, we also have a mechanism as well to be able to send the, the user a SMS and then they read back that SMS code as well. We also don't allow the same call to do a password and MFA reset in the one go, because obviously if they've convinced the service desk person that they are who they say they are and get both things reset, that can be a problem. So we try and restrict it to just, I forgot my password, I still have my second factor, or my phone's broken, but I've still got my password, I only get one thing reset. How long did it take you from the start of when you got Okta until you started that one day cut over on the login? So we signed the contract with Okta three weeks before Octane last year, uh, which if memory serves is about May. The, our cutover day was the 28th of June. Um, so yeah, we, there wasn't a huge amount of lead time. Um, but, yeah. Can you um, talk, uh, or me, or us through the, that custom accounts scenario where you said you could use Google Authenticator for multiple people but for one account? Yep. So, like I said, we have accounts that multiple people do have to log into, whether it's because a couple of people do the same job and there's one account that they use a central account or things like that. So with an authenticator app, and you can use Okta Verify without the push as an authenticator app, uh, you're either given a QR code to scan or a code to type into. And if you save that QR code or 
or the code, you can type it in and enroll multiple phones at once. Um, I know some of the areas have got everyone in the room at the same time, they've done the enrolment and just scan, next one scan, all the way through. Question in the back. Yeah, thanks. Um, as a university, you probably have a large number of new users showing up roughly the same time every year, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously you're looking forward to the deferred enrollment feature, I imagine, but today what do you do? Do you, have, do you enroll them all on day one? Do you stagger that somehow? Okay, so the, it's about the second or third week in January is our very fun week. That's when uh, the state of Victoria issues all of the um, university placements to all the students. So the short answer is on one day, we offer 10,000 places out. And if everyone's an eager student, they enrol at exactly the same time on that one day and we create 10,000 accounts. It normally happens over about a week, but enrolling for MFA is just another step in the, in the enrollment process for the university. So click on your link, yes, this is me, I want to study medicine, I want to do these classes, here's a set my password, enrol in MFA, sign up for these clubs, do this task, do that. It's just another step in the enrolment process. So all new users don't have a choice. It's just the thing they do after they set a password, they enrol for MFA. Have to do it the same as they have to set a password. Thanks. Uh, I, I work at a university also we're in the middle of our MFA rollout and uh, one of the challenges we face, you mentioned um, uh, people who either don't have a phone, don't want to use their phone, whatever, you distribute YubiKeys, we use OTP tokens. Um, the challenge is how do you distribute those? Your volume is a little bit greater than ours. Distribution becomes a giant issue for us. I'm interested in what percentage of your users aren't using phones, therefore using YubiKeys in your case and, and how do you get it to them? <laughs> okay, so we currently have about 2,000 keys in the wild out of our 130,000 enro 130, enrolled users. So while it's a large number, it's not a huge percentage. We're already in that. We only have uh, 5,000 Yeah. Mm. So we have an advantage of we have service centres. Our desktop support guys are spread out across the university, across all the campuses across all the locations. So we just use our internal mail from our central store, which also does all the laptops and the desktops and stuff like that. It's just another item, you know, like you want a new monitor, gets sent out to the uh, local service centre and they either just drop the key off to the user or help them enrol in that. So, yep. How do you get them a how do you get them a key? Yeah, so for the ones that are that wide ranging and I know of a couple of jobs we've had of people over here in the US, uh, someone in Sweden we were dealing with and that sort of thing, uh, we just use the post. Do you trust person? They still have to, to enroll the device, they still have to log in so it's no less secure than it is before MFA. So yeah, that's the best way we can do it. We had a bigger problem with people while we were rolling out traveling, where they weren't in the same location for more than a couple of days and how do we get the key to them? So we had a process where we could, where we'd defer enforcing them for MFA until you know, they contact us, go, I got the email, but I can't be in. <laughs> this is your one. One for you, Jade. Can we access the passwordless experience and the new portal now, or do we have to wait? Um, that's currently in beta. It'll be coming out in EA, uh, hopefully, hopefully by the beginning of H2. Yeah. But so if we're in the beta program, we could access it now. Sorry. If we get into the beta program, we could access it now. Uh, you can access it now. Yes, you can play around with it on your preview logs. Um, but once it, comes to, once it goes to early access, you'll be able to configure it for your production logs for rollout. 
Thank you. And one for you guys. What was the curliest problem you had along the way? <laughs> we had quite a few applications that were very old and very handwritten oh. and very awful <laughs> that no one knew how they were configured. So we had people having to go in and work out how the authentication within the app worked and we'd have to go in and help them work out how to change these applications over that and trying to schedule everything in in such a short period of time because as you can imagine, oh, we're busy at that time, no, we can't do it at this time. But with the help that we had from the push from our CIO and those sort of executives, we had the backing to, yeah, force yeah. the... Yeah, sorry. definitely. We also engaged um, professional services from Okta as well, and they were able to help out with some of those applications like um, WS Fed, because it doesn't play nicely, um, and some open ID stuff as well. Can you um, speak more to how you got executive buy-in on this? I also work at a university, and we're really interested in rolling this out, but we have a lot of concerns about how the effect it'll have on registration or faculty teaching day to day. So can you speak more to that? Mm. Can you just repeat the question, please? Sorry. <laughs> We're used to you guys not understanding us, but sometimes it's a little bit this way too. Sorry, how did you go about getting executive buy-in? Um, we have a lot of concerns about different kinds of users and how they'll react to MFA, so we're very interested in rolling it out, but we don't have that executive buy-in yet. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, that was really easy because, um, because one of our focuses at the university is cybersecurity. Um, and because of all these breaches happening all the time, um, our CIO just, they just wanted it in. So it was them who pretty much came to us to say, hey guys, you need to roll this out by 2017 or, or something like that, or 2018. Yep. So we really didn't need to push them at all. They were more pushing us. So. Yeah, especially when we, our CIO saw some of the attacks that we'd been under, like the silent librarian attack. Mm -hmm. And he was able to push the requirement back up the tree. Mm. And we actually enrolled our senior staff first. So they all saw the process, understood how it happened, understood why it happened. And then they could, we'd have help from them to push it down to everyone else. Also, this is something you're trying to uh, work through. Please come talk to us, after, talk, talk to me afterwards. We can connect you to some other customers who, are, who have been able to successfully do that. We probably have time for just one more question before we wrap up the session. If there aren't any other questions, uh, thank you to our presenters. Thank you for attending. Again, if you would like to see the demo, uh, please contact us, leave, leave the details here, and we can connect you yep. with those resources. Yep. Let's put another round of applause for Andrew and Cameron.